Hello, everyone. I'm glad you're here, and I hope hope you get some questions answered with this presentation. This is something I do every day in clinic: is review the different options of therapy for narcolepsy, and it gives me great joy to be able to spend a, a almost a whole hour doing this, which I'd love to do with every single individual patient clinic. But as we all know, that is not feasible uh, the way in the healthcare system today. But we're talking about the narcolepsy medications in the United States. So just a couple slides about narcolepsy itself. There's many different facets to narcolepsy and different symptoms. And the reason I'm bringing up the symptoms is because sometimes that helps us tailor the treatment, depending on what symptom is most problematic. The most common symptom is excessive daytime sleepiness. With narcolepsy type 1, cataplexy can be seen. In both types of narcolepsy, sleep paralysis and hypnagogic hallucinations can be seen. And disrupted nighttime sleep, more so in type 1, because this is a 24-hour disorder, not just a daytime disorder. Basically, the brain can't figure out when it's supposed to be awake and when it's supposed to be asleep. So their sleep becomes disrupted as well. And other symptoms that happen that aren't in those core symptoms are, but are very frequent and can be very problematic is automatic behavior, which means the way I describe it to people is zoning out or losing time. And that can either, that can be, that can happen in any situation, uh, but a common one is if, um, if you're driving and you get to your destination and don't remember the actual ins and outs of the trip, you know, you obviously stop the stoplights, turn on the turn signals and got there, but it's almost like you're on uh, auto drive sort of thing. And that can happen again in, in any situation that, that, that you're experiencing. So automatic behavior is very common. Dream delusions can be very troublesome. And what those mean are the dreams at night can be so vivid that during the daytime, they're actually, they feel like memories that they have actually happened. And so you might go up to someone and say, oh, remember we talked yesterday about, you know, going to so-and-so and they say, we never had that conversation because that actually happened in a dream and it kind of becomes part of uh, your reality. And then trouble completing tasks, which can have a lot of different facets to it. But just being tired, having poor concentration, and the trouble completing tasks is a very common um, symptom that also is present in ADD and ADHD. And there's a lot of overlap in symptoms between sleep disorders and ADHD. So some of the medicines I will talk about today are FDA approved for ADHD or ADD because we use the same medications for both. But unfortunately, sometimes the medicines are only approved for one indication and not the other. So if you hear me talking about ADD or ADHD with some of these medicines, it's just because that's what is FDA approved for, but we do use it for other sleep disorders. And reviewing the neurotransmitters in our brains that allow us to stay awake, this is important because I'm going to refer back to some of these when we talk about the different therapies. The main ones are orexin, norepinephrine, histamine, dopamine, acetylcholine, and serotonin. I'm a neurologist, so there has to be a picture of the brain in here. There's also a neuron coming up. So this is a, a side, like if, you're, if your brain were cut down the middle and you're looking um, into the middle of the brain, um, half the brain, and there's a red box that says orexin on it, and that's in the hypothalamus. That's one of the neurotransmitters I just listed. That is thought to be the orchestrator of the wakefulness system. And if you see the, the, the red arrows coming out from the orexin hypothalamus center, 
it, it communicates with um, the dopamine uh, nuclei over here. This is where histamine comes from, uh, serotonin, norepinephrine. So again, we like to call it the orchestrator and the coordinator of the waking system. So in narcolepsy type one in particular, the lack of orexin causes chaos in the system. And we try to restore some semblance of control with these medications. And this is a, a, a second brain picture um, is what's called the reticular activating system. And that's the system in our brain that helps keep us awake. And I show you this picture not to be confusing, but the I want you to know that the brain, the brain stem, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but the brain stem is kind of in the middle of the of the brain. And then you see this red pathway that goes up to the cortex of the brain. And we got to get these neurotransmitters, uh, the pathway up to the cortex so we can feel alert. We can't be awake or alert without the outer part of our, our brain, you know, conscious. So these are the different nuclei, histamine here, again, same, same neurotransmitters. Here's where the hypocretins coming from. They're all interconnected. And here is the, the pictorial of the neuron. And this is where the medications actually take effect. This is just a general neuron. And on the left side is the presynaptic neuron that's sending a message. And on the right side is the postsynaptic neuron where it's receiving the message about what to do. And then in the synaptic gap, just the space between the two, that's where the communication happens with the various neurotransmitters. So this is where all of these medicines actually have their effect is, is with the release of the neurotransmitters and trying to get them over here to feel more alert in the postsynaptic neuron. And one more neuron picture. Um, again, this is the, the, the synaptic cleft here. This is a pictorial of dopamine, one of the waking neurotransmitters that is um, housed in the presynaptic neuron, comes to the cell membrane, gets released in the synaptic cleft, and then latches on to these receptors so we can benefit from that dopamine. And this synaptic cleft here is one of many on the, on the bottom of the left-hand picture where you see the synapses. So there's many, 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 many of these that come from a single neuron. This, this on the left is a picture of a single neuron. Under the medications, there are several classes I'm gonna talk about today. Some you take during the daytime, some you take at nighttime, some you take for cataplexy, and some you take for alertness. We're gonna start with the daytime alerting medications. And on the left side of the screen are the stimulants, which are considered controlled substances in the United States. They're schedule two. And the two main ones that have multiple, multiple offshoots and different um, ways, ways they're housed as medications, which I'll get into. One is amphetamine. And amphetamine is potent because it just pushes out dopamine and also serotonin out of the presynaptic neuron into the space and just floods it, floods it. And not only does it prevent dopamine from being taken back up into the presynaptic neuron the way Ritalin does, amphetamine does it much more efficiently than methylphenidate does. So amphetamine can have some more side effects than methylphenidate, but it's very specific to the individual and how their body handles these medications. And then amphetamine is broken down into D-amphetamine, dextroamphetamine, and then L-amphetamine. And these are the two ingredients that make up Adderall that we'll talk about. Um, if, if people out there take Adderall, sometimes on the bottle, it'll say mixed amphetamine salts. And that's because it's these two different types of amphetamines. And then the second big class of stimulants is methylphenidate. 
And that blocks the dopamine from being reuptake into the presynaptic neuron. So it, it just has a lot more dopamine in the cleft available to latch onto those receptors. Non-stimulant wake promoting medicines, the, the first three are schedule four. So they're, they're controlled substances, but on a lesser um, schedule than the stimulants. So we have modafinil. The brand name for that is ProVigil. Our modafinil, which is New Vigil. Solramfetal, which is Sinosi. And then there's one in this group that it has is not scheduled at all, which is Petolescent. And the brand name for that is Wakex. And then we're going to talk about these one by one. And then we'll also address cataplexy medications. The only medications that are FDA approved to treat cataplexy for those that have it are sodium oxabate, which is Xyrem, that's schedule three, oxabate, which is Zywave, schedule three, sodium oxabate extended release, which just got released in the past, I think two months, it's called Lumerize, is schedule three. And then Petolescent, which I'm sorry, I misspelled Petolescent. Petolescent, which is Wakex, is not scheduled, but it is FDA approved to treat cataplexy. Most of the time up to this point, because we had no medications FDA approved to treat cataplexy, we would obviously have to use medications off label, meaning that they weren't approved for cataplexy, but we know that they work because we've been using them for decades. Venlafaxine, which is a Fexor, atomoxetine, which is Stratera. There's a group called tricyclic antidepressants like clomipramine, and then SSRIs like fluoxetine. So, so there's a lot of things we use for cataplexy that are off label, but the oxabates and the patolescent are the ones that are FDA approved. So we're gonna talk about the stimulants first and they all have the same list of side effects, um, no matter which one you're on. So I was just gonna list the side effects that can happen, particularly with stimulants like the amphetamines and meth methylphenidate, but also they can happen with the non-stimulant medications but are much less frequent. But with the stimulants like amphetamines and methylphenidate, it's ramping up your brain, your whole brain. So it can cause anxiety or worsening of underlying anxiety. It can affect the mood either way and make you feel like hypomanic or can go the other way and make you feel depressed. Any, any medication that works on the brain can have any impact on mood, whether we're talking um, antidepressant, stimulants, sleeping pills, um, anything can have any effect on the mood. These can cause hallucinations. Again, that's not common, but it does happen. We always watch for the blood pressure and heart rate as they can be elevated with stimulants. If they stick around too long um, in the body, after you take them, it can cause insomnia, difficulty getting to sleep. Or if, you know, by accident or not, you take them too late in the day and they're still in your body when you're trying to go to bed. They can cause headaches, diarrhea, heart arrhythmias. And an important one is appetite suppression, especially in children and teenagers. And I have several adults that this is a problem with that they just don't feel the need to eat. And we have to watch their weight to make sure it doesn't get dangerously low. And all those side effects are summed up in this picture and the print is small. So I'll go over it starting on the left-hand side. So stimulants can impact the brain by increasing dopamine and norepinephrine, which can help alertness and make you feel uh, euphoric. 
It can increase epinephrine, making your body feel like it's on edge, hypervigilant. It can decrease testosterone and impact libido. It can cause your heart to have arrhythmias. It can increase your blood pressure. It takes blood flow away from the gut. And that's what causes the suppressed appetite. And then a big one, which I want you to be aware of, is it can restrict the blood flow to your fingers and toes. So if you have Raynaud's, where you go out outside or you're in a cold environment and your fingertips kind of hurt, and then they may turn blue even, that can be worsened by stimulants because they vasoconstrict, meaning they make the blood vessel smaller and deliver even less blood flow to the extremities. And I put this picture of the heart on there in an EKG as a reminder that we don't wanna mess with the heart and we need to be very um, aware and cognizant to make sure the heart rate isn't too elevated, make sure there's no abnormal palpitations, meaning you feel like your heart's gonna jump out of your chest because it's beating so hard or so fast. And the way to uh, follow this with stimulants, there's many ways to do it. Lots of people I follow that have narcolepsy will wear an activity monitor on their wrist that captures heart rate. And that gives us an idea of kind of the daily variation of the heart rate. So if you're at rest, if you're you know, not active, if you're watching TV or working or sitting in a lecture and your heart rate is 100 with no, uh, no activity, then that's a little high for baseline. And that can be caused by these stimulants. So what we want to know as the prescribing doctor beforehand is what is your pulse without any stimulants in your body? And sometimes doctors will order an EKG as they're starting stimulant medication, just to have a baseline, just to make sure there's no underlying arrhythmias. It's not common that it causes cardiac issues. So it's not something to be um, completely scared of, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, so the stimulants, I mentioned the Raynaud syndrome, that it can worsen that when the stimulant is in your body because it's constricting the blood vessels. In people that have interstitial cystitis, and you'll know what that is if you have it or if you know someone with it, it can cause your bladder, the, the interstitial cystitis itself makes your bladder irritable and you have to urinate a lot. The stimulants can make that even worse. I've seen that several times. Stimulants can trigger underlying arrhythmias. So say that you have a genetic predisposition to an arrhythmia, it might never have manifested unless you took something that brought it out. And then something that just I want you to hear is that even though these are scheduled medications, meaning they're um, high risk for abuse if given to the wrong individual, if they're taken as prescribed, there's an extremely low rate of abuse. And now on the specific types of medications, the first I'm gonna start with is methylphenidate. And that is the generic name for Ritalin. And the way I try to explain this is these uh, five different um, options I have here, they're all methylphenidate, but they're packaged differently. So the top one, methylphenidate IR, that means immediate release, lasts about four hours. And that can be used if, say, someone is uh, getting off of work at four or five o'clock, they've got a long drive ahead of them to get home, they feel tired, they can take a short acting immediate release stimulant to help, help them get home that hopefully is out of their system by bedtime or a meeting at work or uh, 
long class after lunch, um, various situations where you might need a boost. Then there's methylphenidate LA. LA is for long acting. And that lasts about twice as long as the immediate release, about eight hours. It actually has a short acting and a long acting in this Ritalin LA, which conceptually is really nice because the immediate release will take effect in about 15 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes. And then the controlled release portion takes over after that. So sometimes with controlled release, the, the increase is kind of slow, but once it gets to the level, it's really nice. But if you have this mixture of short acting and long acting, it can take care of your immediate needs and you know for the next eight hours. And then there's methylphenidate XR extended release. The brand name is Concerta. That might be more familiar to you. And that can last 10 to 12 hours. The transdermal methylphenidate is a patch, it's a skin patch, and you can put that on in the morning and it takes about two hours for it to really kind of reach its level. And then you're supposed to take it off a couple hours before bedtime so it doesn't contribute to insomnia. And this is a great option for people that have digestive issues um, or have erratic absorption of medication for whatever reason, um, or perhaps they've had stomach surgery and they are not supposed to take controlled release medications, this is a nice option. The, the biggest problem that I've seen people have with the skin patch is a reaction to the adhesive, redness, burning, itchiness. And then the last one listed is Dex methylphenidate. And the brand name for that is Focalin. And that uses the, the D isomer we talked about with amphetamine, DM, dextroamphetamine, levoamphetamine, methylphenidates the same way. It uses the dextromethylphenidate, which is more potent instead of combining it with the levo, it's pure de dextro. And that comes in immediate release and extended release as well. So this is methylphenidate on a slide in its many packaged forms. And um, the common name for methylphenidate is Ritalin. Again, just to bring that up, that it's a great medication. It's a matter of finding the form, the length of action, the delivery system that works best for the individual. The next slide is about Adderall. So the brand name is Adderall, but the generic is that mixed amphetamine salts. And what that means is you have the, the top line where it says amphetamine and dextroamphetamine, that should actually be levoamphetamine, L-amphetamine and D-amphetamine, dextroamphetamine. So you've got a mixture of these in Adderall. The D-amphetamine is more potent and it causes a lot more central nervous system side effects, meaning higher heart rate, headaches, tremor, sweatiness, things like that, than the levoamphetamine. So the ratio of dextro to levo in Adderall is three to one. So it leans more towards the dextroamphetamine than the levo. So Adderall tends to have, if you're gonna have side effects, more of those central nervous system side effects, um, mood issues, tachycardia, high heart rate, um, irritability, sweatiness, things like that. And just a note that Adderall also increases serotonin. So if you're on another medication that might be using serotonin and increase serotonin, we just know as the physician to watch to make sure that you're not overloaded with serotonin. 
uh, which again is rare, but it happens. Um, with an overload of serotonin, you get real pink cheeked and flushed and feel very crummy. Methylphenidate, the one we talked about before, does not use serotonin, but Adderall does have an impact on serotonin, which is important to know. And one of the big um, common irritating, often limiting side effects can be dry mouth and constipation. It depends as the risk benefit thing, if the alertness is fantastic, they can find ways around the dry mouth, like chewing gum, biotin, so forth. But this is an extremely common side effect of the Adderall. So this is an example of a medication, Mydeus. If you kind of look at it, it actually is my day is my deus. This is only FDA approved for ADHD. It is not FDA approved for narcolepsy. The reason I bring this up is that if someone is having side effects, central nervous system side effects on Adderall that has that three to one ratio, my deus has a one to one ratio. So it has less of the dextroamphetamine and less central nervous system side effects. So if I have someone with narcolepsy and they have a, a coexisting diagnosis of ADHD that I can get this approved because it's newer and there's not a generic for it yet, this is a fantastic next step if Adderall is not tolerated due to central nervous system side effects. And this is 12 hours in length, my deus is. Same ingredients as Adderall, just different proportion. And then there's simply dextroamphetamine as a medication. So no Levo, just dextroamphetamine that comes in four, eight and 12 hour forms. Again, it's packaged differently. There's a four hour form and the, this is kind of an older term, but dextrostat, so stat means right away. So it releases immediately dextrostat, short acting. There's an eight hour form, which is dexedrine ER, extended release. And then there is a medicine called Vivance, which is uh, relatively newer and just went generic, by the way. And it's what's called a prodrug of dexedrine, which means that what when you swallow the pill, it's not dexedrine, but it turns into dexedrine in the digestive system. And this is a long acting, four, up to 14 hours length of action of medication. And just recently in the past month or two, this is only FDA approved for ADHD, but it's beneficial for anyone that needs stimulants is the transdermal amphetamine. So that's a skin patch, just like there's a transdermal methylphenidate or Ritalin. There's now a transdermal amphetamine. Lasts about nine hours, have to remove it in time before you go to bed so it doesn't linger. Um, and this again is advantageous if someone has gastrointestinal disorders that might prevent predictable absorption of oral medication. And those are the stimulants. We just covered the stimulants. So those are the controlled substances. Um, some are approved for narcolepsy, some are approved for ADHD, some are approved for both narcolepsy and ADHD, um, but they're all effective. Now we're going to the non-stimulant medications. Modafinil, the brand name is Provigil, has been around a while since 1998. It's approved for 18 years and older. 
it increases alertness, but it does not work in the same way that the stimulants work in. It's different. It does not improve symptoms of ADD or ADHD typically. And they're just out of interest. It's approved for three different things for narcolepsy, shift work disorder, meaning say you work late shift or overnight and your body never adjusts to that. It can help in that situation. And then the third FDA indication is residual sleepiness despite having your sleep apnea treated. There's two different strengths, 100 milligram strength and 200 milligram strength. This lasts about eight hours in the average body. So for a whole kind of normal 16 hour day, you often need to take two doses, one in the morning one in the afternoon, typically up to 400 milligrams. The studies that were done when this tab, when this came out actually went up to 800 milligrams, but there was no significant improvement in symptoms, but it did document safety at those higher doses. And the most important thing, or one of the most important things of today, if you take away anything, is to make sure that if you're on females, obviously, if you're on a hormonal birth control, such as birth control pills or the, the implants, the Nexplanon, that modafinil will interfere with the birth control and make it ineffective. It's extremely important to know. And the other interesting thing about modafinil is that not only does it work through dopamine, but there's evidence to show that it also works through these other neurotransmitters, histamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Armodafinil, or new vigil is the other name for that, is I call it a sister drug to provigil just because ProVigil was out first and then the company lost their patent and came out with new Vigil. They're very similar. This is for 18 and older. This is longer acting. It lasts closer to all day. So it's advantageous, sorry, advantageous in the sense that people don't have to redose. Again, it's not FDA approved for ADD or ADHD but it is approved for the same thing as modafinil, the narcolepsy, shift work disorder, and residual sleepiness with obstructive sleep apnea. There's, there's several different strengths. The lowest is 50 milligrams. The highest is 250 milligrams. And also this interferes with hormonal birth control, just like the modafinil. Makes it ineffective, but you're not even taking it. A relatively newer one on the market is Solreamphetol, which is Sinosi. It was FDA approved in 2019 and it's called a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, meaning that it there's more dopamine and norepinephrine in the synaptic space to latch onto those postsynaptic receptors. This is cleared by the kidney which means that there's no interaction with birth control pills, which go through the liver. So this is nice as an option to use if a non-stimulant waking medicine is needed. Sinosi does not interfere with contraceptives. And this is supposed to last all day. And a typical dose is 150 milligrams in the morning. The next medication, non-stimulant, is Pitolescent, which is Wakex. This is a novel mechanism for treatment of narcolepsy as it works through histamine. It was FDA approved also in 2019. Wakex and Sinosi came out around the same time. This is approved for excessive daytime sleepiness. And the following year, 
This was a big deal. It got FDA approved for cataplexy as well. It's a big deal because there are so few medicines FDA approved. And also, if you can treat two symptoms with one medication, meaning the sleepiness and the cataplexy, that's fantastic, as opposed to having to piecemeal treatment, having a stimulant and an antidepressant to treat two different symptoms. This is not a controlled substance. It does interfere with hormonal contraceptives, again, just like armadafinil and modafinil, pitolacin or Wakex negates, makes the hormonal contraceptive inactive. And I put a picture of a heart tracing there just because there is a slight, it's called a QT prolongation. And again, that's something that you'll know if, you, if you've been diagnosed with that, either you've heard of it or you haven't. Um, but if you have an inherent QT prolongation, then this could prolong that. And you just have to be cognizant of that. And there are other medications like general medications for other indications, other body parts, things like that, that also can prolong the QT interval. So you need to be aware that if you have too many of those medications together, you just have to watch, watch the heart rate, do EKGs to make sure that you're not putting people at risk for arrhythmias. It's not that you can't use them together. That's not what I'm saying at all, but it's just an awareness. And I wanted to put, I think this is the last neuron, by the way, but this, I wanted to remind myself to talk about the histamine because most people are aware of histamine because of antihistamines, which are allergy medications. And the sedating sedating allergy medications such as Benadryl, which is diphenhydramine, and Zyrtec is really sedating for a lot of people as well. They will compete for the histamine receptors with the increased histamine that Pitolacin does by its mechanism. So the Wakex, which is Pitolacin, it increases histamine, which in this picture here, the blue one, two, three, uh, pentagons, it releases more histamine from the presynaptic neuron. And the goal for narcolepsy is to get more histamine in the synaptic cleft so it can latch onto these H1 receptors. Well, if you're competing with Benadryl or Zyrtec or whatever, then the Pitolacin might not be as effective. Moving on to oxabate, this is oxabate itself, just oxabate is Zywave is the brand name, and sodium oxabate comes in two different forms, Zyrem, which is twice a night dosing, and the newer one, Lumerize, which is once a night dosing. These are FDA Schedule Three controlled substances. They kick in quickly. So you have to do all your pre-bedtime ritual prior to taking this. Take this, get right into bed, allow yourself to relax and go to sleep. If you can't fall asleep right away, you can potentially feel nauseous, dizzy, uh, shaky, um, unsteady, and it's really uncomfortable. These medications allow you to go into hours and hours of true deep sleep, meaning slow wave sleep, which is incredibly restorative for the hormones in your body, for your brain to get rest and so forth. And the beauty of this medication, one of the beauties is that you can wake up feeling actually like you slept. You can wake up feeling rested. Whereas if you compare that to a general sleep aid that you might give someone with narcolepsy, a general sleep aid might decrease the number of awakenings someone's having, but probably is not going to make you feel better rested. Now, the slow wave sleep sometimes 
and we're talking one or 2%, not a lot. The slow wave sleep can be so deep that occasionally people can wet the bed or have incontinence just because they're in such a deep sleep. If that happens, we just reduce the dose or fluid restrict prior to bedtime. The way that we think it works in the brain, in addition to increasing slow wave sleep, is the neurons in the brain, while this is in the body, the neurons are storing up in the presynaptic cleft, storing up all the waking neurotransmitters like dopamine, norepinephrine, and histamine. And when the oxabate formulation leaves the body in the morning, your brain floods gets flooded with the waking neurotransmitters and they get this surge of alertness and people wake up and actually feel rested. It doesn't last all day typically, but it gets you out of bed. Oxabate is gamma hydroxybutyrate, GHB. GHB is known on the street as the date rape drug. And it's also abused in bodybuilders because growth hormone is released in slow wave sleep. So apparently that increases their ability to gain muscle mass. And it is a normal substance in our brains uh, to a small degree. And it has a long history, actually. Uh, this is a brief, brief overview, but it's been used several decades ago, back to 1960, for various things. It was used for anesthesia at one point. It's been used for um, alcohol withdrawal to ease the symptoms of that. It's been used for mental health. Uh, it was uh, sold at like, you know, GNC or whatever in the 1980s over the counter. And then it was banned. And then around the year 2000, 2002 is when it came available for narcolepsy with cataplexy um, in the form of Xyrem, sodium oxabate. Sodium oxabate, the twice a night version is called Xyrem. And this is a picture, it comes in a bottle, comes from it's only, there's one pharmacy it comes from, so they can keep track of it. Uh, you, you draw up the amount of uh, Xyrem that you need and put it in these these medicine containers and dilute it with a quarter cup of water. And that's how you get the dose ready for the nighttime. Xyrem and Lumrise, both of them, have a lot of salt, 1,640 milligrams in a full dose, if you, if you titrate up to the full nine gram dose. And it's grams, not milligrams. For the, for the oxabate is grams, sodium is milligrams. Xyrem and Zywave both, you have to use two doses at night because it's half-life is super short. It tastes salty, as you can imagine, and you need to have an empty belly for it to be effective. So the recommendation is to not eat for two hours before. Some people need to not eat for three hours before. And this is a medication that you start at a low dose and titrate up because if you started on week four dose from the get-go, you would be sick and vomiting and feel horrible. The same company came out with uh, Oxabate many years later, or Zywave, which has 131 milligrams of sodium in a full dose. Same titration, same one for one dosing. And it tastes by description that I've heard like unbelievably syrupy, sappy sweet. This is something the company put out and it, it, it's just, it, it just, it tickles me. So the 1640 milligrams in Xyrem and Lumrise is equivalent to four large orders of French fries um, when you compare it to the 131 milligrams in Zywave or Oxabate. Lumrise is the once a night form that just recently came out. It comes in packets 
or sachets, they call them. It's a powdery substance that you dilute in water and take it again just once a night. On the left side of the screen is an example of the blood levels of the two doses of Xyrem and Zywave. You get this first peak. This is the time down here at the bottom. You get this first peak and then it goes out of your body. You take a second dose two and a half to four hours later and you get an even higher peak and then it's out of the body. The loom rise, which is once a night, it gets a peak and then it slowly goes down. What the scientists look at is it's called area under the curve. So basically it's all this white space under the curve. And the area under the curve, if you add up the white space under both of those peaks and this are equivalent. You can definitely use combinations of medications a lot of people that are on oxabate or sodium oxabate wake up feeling great, but they need an additional wake promoting medicine or stimulant to get through the day. Very, very common to combine these medications, even a stimulant with modafinil. As long as your body is tolerating it and you're not getting side effects and your blood pressure, heart rate, um, mood, so forth is is doing okay and it helps your symptoms, you can definitely combine these medications. A quick shout out to caffeine, the most commonly used stimulant. How it works is it blocks adenosine. Adenosine builds up in our body from the minute we wake up in the morning. It builds, 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 builds. We get sleepier, 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 sleepier throughout the day. And just interestingly, this is how caffeine works as it blocks adenosine. Basically the caffeine, which is purple, basically blocks out the adenosine and takes over the receptors to decrease sleepiness. This is just a pictorial of caffeine. It's the milligrams on the side here. Uh, you got green tea, Coke, black tea, you know, increasing amounts of caffeine, a Red Bull here. Um, there's a lot of, of pre-workouts to be aware of that have caffeine, 200 milligrams, 300 milligrams of caffeine. And then this 5150 juice looks like it's horrible in the amount of caffeine, but um, these are very commonly used for self-medication for sleepiness. Everyone metabolizes caffeine differently. There are long metabolizers of caffeine, meaning that this is an example of a person, a long metabolizer that has a cup of coffee at eight in the morning, 10 in the morning, and then another one at 4 p.m. And it takes all night into the morning for it to completely leave the body. This is not everyone, but a lot of people are long metabolizers. Tips to increase morning alertness if, if you're not on Oxabate. Uh, you can set your alarm 20 to 30 minutes before you need to wake up, take your medication, and then have a second alarm that will actually be the time you start your day. Oxabate can help you wake up. And then there is, this is ADHD medicine. It's called Journey. It's not for narcolepsy, FDA approved, but it's approved for ADHD. Delayed release methylphenidate. You take it at bedtime, and when it reaches your large intestine nine hours later, it starts releasing methylphenidate, and it's easier to wake up in the morning. There's coffee naps. Same thing you can do with short-acting stimulants. Take the stimulant or cup of coffee, and then immediately take a nap, and it's kicked in after you've had a 20 or 30-minute nap, and you wake up feeling better refreshed. And that's the end. And I am going to look at the chat for questions. Oh, Q&A, here we go. The first one is, can you talk about medication management for women who are interested in getting pregnant or who are pregnant? What you're gonna hear, because it's true, but not practical, is no medications for pregnancy. 
the practical answer is we have years and years and years of data for stimulants, Ritalin, Adderall, things like that, that as long as you watch the growth of the baby and that it's not um, stopping growing, we just use the lowest dose we can get by with. So you're safe and you can um, go to work or whatever it is you need to do. I need to stop sharing my screen here. Okay, I think I'm back. Uh, my daughter, age 25, can't take Xyrem on an empty stomach. She needs to have some food in her stomach. Otherwise she will be nauseous. Is that okay? It is okay to have food in the stomach. It's not dangerous or anything, but it decreases the absorption or the effectiveness. So if you have a stomach full of food and you take the oxabate, that peak, that graph I showed you before where it increases and then comes down will be blunted to 50% because it can't absorb if there's food in the stomach. So what, what you could do, if, if food in the stomach works and the medication still is effective, that's fine. But Sometimes you can get nausea medicine from your doctor to take, you know, an hour before the oxabate that can help. And I've got not many, but I've got a couple of people that are frequent users of anti-nausea medicine so they can tolerate the oxabate. Is there decrease in effectiveness over time? Is dosage based on management of symptomatology? Dosage is definitely based on management and how you respond because almost with every medication, I can't think of one exception, the higher the dose, the more likely you are to have side effects and the more severe the side effects become. So we start low. A lot of people will get by with small, small doses. It surprises me at times, but we just increase it till you have effective treatment and watch for side effects. There can be tolerance built up over time and you just need a short break, maybe a week off of the medication, or some people will take the medication for six days in a row and not take it on Sunday, and that helps prevent tolerance. Um, it's very common to get tolerance, but it's not the end of the world. You just need a, a small break, and then it'll be effective once again. Oxabate does, has not shown any tolerance at all. Are there studies that look at the etiology of narcolepsy with or without cataplexy? It's a really good question. The etiology with cataplexy is thought to be lack of orexin, that that's the director, the conductor of the wake, waking system, that without orexin, it's chaos. But that's not the case in narcolepsy type two or narcolepsy without cataplexy. That is a question that needs to be researched and answered, we don't know. With that said, are there defects in the fetus of taking Xyrem and Adderall when born long term? Um, there have been no defects like organ defects associated consistently with stimulants or with oxabate, but there have been with Nuvigil, which is armadaphanil, and a Canadian registry. So we we definitely have people come off Nuvigil and Provigil for sure in the first trimester because that's when all the organs are formed, but not we have not seen that with oxabate or stimulants. If I'm taking half a pill of Sinosi every morning, how long should it last throughout the day? Oh, in theory, it should last, uh, what I would say with half a pill, if your body similarly is like the bodies that were researched, and there may be other medications that that are at play here, but I would say at least until early afternoon, but everyone's different. I have people that take half a pill of Sinosi every morning and they're great all day. Other people take half a pill and can't even tell they've taken anything. Does Zyrem suppress dreaming? Has there been research about the long-term impact of Zyrem with regards to REM and dreaming and the health psychological benefits of dreaming? Not that I know of about the impact of potential um, on dreaming with Zyra. And it's not necessarily 
I don't know if this is the, if this is going to come out right, but it's not necessarily that it suppresses dreaming, but it replaces it potentially can replace some REM sleep, which is dreaming sleep, with the massive amounts of slow wave sleep that it produces. I am taking armadafinil and patolicent and do not seem to have any issues with it. I am also on a CPAP or OSA. Is there any chance of patolicent to come out in generic form? Not anytime soon. It just came out 2019. Typically it's at least seven years. It'll happen, but no time soon. Now I can say just from my experience with the company, they have been really good about patient assistance. Um, and I don't even know if I have one patient that has a copay. So I hope that you're getting assistance and that that's a positive thing for you to be able to stay on it long term. Would you recommend baseline EKG prior to starting meds, even if not cardiac history? That is a call um, with each doctor on what they're comfortable with. I have peers that will not start a waking medicine without an EKG. I have peers that have never ordered an EKG unless there's symptoms. Um, I'm kind of of the of the mindset that it's nice to have a baseline EKG just in case. Sometimes there's genetic arrhythmias that people don't know about yet that haven't manifested in their parents and they might be prone to it. So you can never go wrong with getting a baseline EKG. Dr. Stevens, I just want to jump in and uh, let you know that we are getting close to time. If you have a few minutes to answer a few more, we can continue. Or if we need to go ahead and stop, we can we can cut it now. I will keep going if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. This okay. is great. Okay. Okay. Not a question, but an important FYI for other narcoleptics. Just something I learned during my travels. Most of these drugs are banned in other countries. It is important to look into the country's travel policies and make changes to your prescriptions before travels. That is really important. Yeah, very important. Can Wakex and Orsinosi add effectiveness to stimulant medication? Absolutely. Does it matter the time of day I take Sinosi? Only from the standpoint that you take it early enough so it doesn't interfere with your sleep at night. I hope that answers the question. I have some people that will, for example, take half in the morning and then half at 11 a.m. Um, it just depends on your body. Some people can take it at 1 p.m. and go to sleep no matter what. Um, other people, even they take it early in the morning, it might still impact their sleep. So it just depends on how your body reacts to it. And also keeping in mind that if you add caffeine on top of Sinosi or any of these wake promoting agents or stimulants, it enhances the alerting effects. So just to be aware that it's not that you can't have caffeine with these, but it definitely can contribute to side effects. Is there any update on the shortage of amphetamines? They have been very difficult to obtain for some time now. It's horrible. No, there's no update other than it's still hideous. And because Adderall was, uh, XR was uh, in short supply. Now Vivance, 60 and 70 milligram Vivance are in short supply, but the generic just came out of Vivance. So hopefully that'll be a remedy. Um, I have been able to get Adderall XR recently for patients. So that seems to be getting better, but you know, having done this for 20 years, this is a cycle that happens that the numbers the government allows of these stimulus to be made by the manufacturers limit how much they can make. And when whatever manufacturer has whatever limit they're given by the government, if they run out, then it's the next manufacturer that makes stimulant B that then has to ramp up production and then they hit their limit and it's just this cycle, but it's never been this bad in 20 years, but it's been a consistent cycle as long as I've done this. Is it possible that Xyrem causes GERD? Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you, great. Oh, good. I'm glad, I'm glad it was informative. And um, please mention the weight gain stimulants again. Stimulants typically suppress appetite. And if anything, 
um, reduce the craving for food and cause weight loss with stimulants. And um, wake promoting medicines, meaning new vigil, pro vigil, wake exenosi, have the potential to suppress appetite, but I've not seen it be as strong of a problem. Usually I saw a kiddo this week, 20 years old, um, that his body mass index is 18 and he's got to be on stimulants because of his narcolepsy. And it's just a very fragile dance between getting too skinny and, or let me put it another way, maintaining appropriate body mass index and forcing down food. He says it's just hard. He does, it's not, it doesn't taste good to him. Um, he's working his way up calories. He's trying to build muscle mass by going to a trainer, but it can be a really big limiting side effect 